guys, it's uh, David McGee here with another edition of Little Did You Know. At this point in the program, I normally say that uh, this is a chat show in which I talk to people I find interesting, and I hope you agree. But on this occasion, I have a feeling it's going to be a case of, I know you'll agree. Um, my guest calls himself a national trinket and a renowned homosexual. Um, he's, more importantly, one of the UK's best-loved comedians and one of the cleverest as well. And now he's established another career as a writer. He's got a book, a new book coming out next October called The Lick of Love. Um, here, coming to us uh, from, I think, Swindon, I believe, is the very wonderful Julian Clary. Yes, hello. I'm in my mother's um, back room, as it were. Um, and this is a bizarre situation because I have known you, David, since 1980, 81. Um, and you've written so much of my nonsense over the years, but you've never interviewed me. So this could go either way. Um, so I have a natural suspicion of journalists or interviewers, but I don't have a natural suspicion of you. So um, let's sally forth and see what happens. You also have, Julian, selective memory, because I have interviewed you uh, several times, and I'll be bringing up one of our interviews, which was done for this magazine. Oh, no. Oh, Q Axel. Right, OK. <laughs> I'm afraid so. But that was a long time ago in 2005, and only Patreon subscribers are going to be privy to that. Now, um, you're in Swindon, as you say, uh, but uh, uh, this week you're in the lovely um, Georgian city of Bath. Why do you find yourself there? Because we opened in the dresser on Wednesday, um, which I'm doing with Matthew Kelly. So we've done our first Wednesday, Thursday, we've done our first four performances. We get today off. So I rushed to my mother's side, who's not happy about me taking an hour off to talk nonsense to you. She said, tell David McGee, you have better things to do. I have watered the hanging baskets. I've taken the rubbish bins out. Um, but she's waiting for us to drink gin and watch the Antiques Roadshow. Um, but I said, I, it has to be done, you know. Well, if she calls up the stairs, Julian, will you please tell her that we're going to get through this as fast as possible? I'm not upstairs, I'm downstairs in the granny flat. But you see, this is our day off. So tomorrow morning at nine o'clock, I have to go back to Bath for apparently more rehearsals. <laughs> I can't imagine why they're necessary. Uh, the Dresser is uh, a play by Ronald Harwood, who was actually a dresser for the Shakespearean actor um, Donald Wolfitt. And this is, you know, a fictionalised account of his life on the road with somebody he calls Sir, as you say, played by Matthew Kelly. Now, Jules, so many great actors have played your part, the part of Norman, mm. Professor Tom Courtney, Ian McKellen. Now, some may say that these are big shoes to fill. I would say that I can't imagine why it's taken so long for you to be cast in the, in the part you were born to play. What do you think? Um, well, I can't think about all that, you know, heavy shoes to fill or whatever it was you said. Um, I just read it because I did a play three or four years ago at the Trafalgar Studios and that was kind of proper acting or, and I got the taste for it and I thought, well, this is quite a nice diversion from being in my world and talking about myself all the time. I'd like to do some more. So I got an acting agent and he kept asking me, do you like the look of the staircase? Do you like the look of this or that? And I didn't. And but when I read the dresser, I there was something about it that really appealed to me. And um, so I'm doing it because I th think I can, on because I want to. And um, I can't. You know, there's too much else. There's too much to remember. There's too much to worry about without thinking about all that side of stuff. 
this play has been gestating for a long time, for obvious reasons. Now, in this long, long build-up, more than a year, I mean, what were your nerves like? Were they in tatters? No, I don't really get that nervous. I mean, I, I, it was one of the you know happy side effects of COVID is that I had an extra year to get to grips with it and the script. And Matthew and I um, twice weekly did Zoom um, read-throughs and then kind of testing each other and getting to know each other. So it, it was it was very useful. So by the time we started rehearsals four or five weeks ago, I felt as if I knew it quite well. Um, was it Anthony Hopkins who played Sir a few years ago? I believe he did. I didn't see yeah. that, that production, but, but um, um, famously in the film, it was Albert Finney. Yes, but Anthony Hopkins had this thing about, I, I read an interview where he was talking about acting. He said, you, for him, for him anyway, he said, I have to know the script inside out on the first day of rehearsals. So um, that's what I decided to do. Um, but, you know, acting is a funny business and it's a very different business from comedy. So what I've discovered in this last week, which I already knew, of course, but my brain, while, I'm, while we're doing the play, I keep thinking of alternative lines, you know, to enhance it. And there was a minor, minor drying incident on the first night. And Emma Amos, who is her ladyship, tried to help me by saying, so what? Did you, what happened next? <laughs> and I said, well, it's funny you should ask. And I was about to go into an improvisation about what Norman could have done in Market Square that evening. But you'll be pleased to know I stopped myself and I thought, no, this isn't right. You must get back to the script. No, this is proper acting. Now you, you're, um, uh, well, we're both a dab hand at uh, self-deprecation, but you've often called yourself a camp old turn, but, but here you are doing the proper acting again. Very I'm being a lovey, not a turn. A, a, a lovey? I'm now a lovey, not a turn for the next few weeks. It's a nice difference, yes. Um, you're uh, in Bath. What was it like last Wednesday stepping out onto the stage for the first time? Well, it was a relief. You know, we did four weeks in a, a tatty old disused school hall in Kennington. Um, and there's only so much I can give to an empty room. I was desperate for an audience. I was desperate to see if there were laughs and titters and where they were going to come. Um, so my main feeling was relief. I mean, I, I was obviously, a nervous wreck, um, but the overriding feeling was of joy and relief. And also get something back for your trouble. You know, people do clap at the end and um, the end of a run through, you just have to wait for the director to get out his notepad, um, which is a thankless task. I have to ask you, Jules, how did it go? It went fine, thank you. Um, I can't say, you know, that the words kept coming <laughs> continuously. It's this funny thing of distracting yourself, isn't it? I'm trying to stay in the moment in the play, but there's this whole dialogue going on in your head, which is fatal. So I'm slowly learning to disregard that and to, and to channel Norman and to just um, believe in it. And it's not about me, it's about the play and it's about everyone's joint effort. Well, uh, this, this programme goes out on the 27th of September, which means that tomorrow uh, the show will open at the Theatre Royal of Brighton. Well, how about that? Is this oh, something of a gift to the campest town in Britain? Well, it's, the, it's one of the most perfect settings for The Dresser, which is set in 1942 in the Dowdy Theatre, if I may use that word. Um, you know, it's all a bit run down and beautiful, but faded, which, um, forgive me, is how I think of the Theatre Royal Brighton. Um, but yes, it is. It's a camp city. Is it a city? I believe it is now. Yes, is. and of course, connections with Brighton, haven't you? Yes, I can have a blow on the front between shows. 
You used to live there. I had a flat there for a few years, yes. Um, happy days. Do you know who my guest was last week? Will it be anyone I've heard of? Oh, it was Dolly Diamond. Dolly Diamond, who was, who was living down there. But now I'm moved to Islington, I believe. Oh, you're up with the latest, yes. It's yeah. True. Yes, it's true. That was just a sort of stopping point, um, I believe, um, in Rose Gardens <coughs> back passage, but now has moved to Islington. It's true, for the benefit of those of you who didn't see my chat with uh, Dolly Diamond. Yes, in fact, she was sharing a flat with uh, another, oh, are we allowed to say this, drag queen. Is that a hate crime? No, I don't think so. Rose Garden. Um, now, uh, many reasons for wanting to see this production of The, the Dress of Jewels. Uh, Julian Clary and Matthew Kelly. And I, I must mention this because it was something you told me. You were very impressed with the direction of Terry Johnson. Yes, he's a proper director. It's all about the thought behind the action. Because, you know, it was one thing to learn the lines and then we were told to move from left to right. And as the dresser, I have to dress, sir, and I had to take his clothes off and I have to put his costume on and I have to hand him various props, um, which, which threw me a bit. But if there's a thought behind the action and you can relate that to the script, um, yes, um, it's, it's a different world. It was all quite highbrow, but you know, I'm, my life is standing center stage in front of a microphone. I can rehearse the shows that you and I put on together in well, a couple of days. <laughs> At the most, I mean, it might take a year and a half to write it, but the rehearsing of it is, you know, stand in front of the microphone, look at the audience and make things up as you go along. So this, this is different. There's a fourth wall and all of that. But no, um, he is, um, he's very, very impressive and um, a clever man. So uh, that, that's, that's the director's job then, to help the actor do it properly and with greater ease. Yes, and to, to find what's going on in the script, to find what the author means, which is, I think he's particularly good at. Well, um, you'll be touring for a period, but then you have to take a break because uh, you're back at the London Palladium in, in Panto Land. Now, um, this is another show of yours, there's several, that was affected by the pandemic. Um, mm. The show was at the London Palladium last Christmas. Uh, briefly, remind me, how many performances did you do before you had to close? Six, I think. We were there three days, we did six shows, and we were just getting the taste for it, and then the guillotine fell, and um, it had to be put under cover. So it's, it's coming back in a slightly different form. We don't have Beverly Knight, we have Donny Osmond. And um, yes, so it, it'll be the same kind of, I mean, it's it's Pantoland, it's, let's face it, a, ver a variety show. So um, anything could happen. You, you, you've answered my question. It's going to be a different show because it's got a different uh, star, Donny Osmond. It opens uh, on December the 4th at the London Palladium but uh, there's another connection between that last uh, production and this, uh, well, there's several, there's, well, there's Nigel Havers for one thing, but also there's um, Gary Wilmot. Now, have you heard about whether he'll be doing another of his tongue-twisting, show-stopping songs? Yes, he will. Well, last year he revived the underground song, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a bit of a kind of greatest hits show, this. So um, he's definitely in, in the show, but the, the script is a work in progress. So whether he's doing that again or something new, I don't, I'm not sure. And can you give us any little hint, no spoilers, please, about what you'll be doing? Well, I've written one joke, which I don't know if it's going to get through. Shall I preview it for you? Oh, we'd be honoured. So let me get this right. I come out and I, with Donny and I say, oh, Donny, how marvellous to meet you. Do you know I had a poster of you on my bedroom wall when I was younger? And he says, did you put my brothers up as well? 
<laughs> and I say, I beg your pardon, or something. Something like that. But it all depends. I'm not sure whether Don is going to go for the filth or if he is, you know, does it suit him? What do we know about Donny Osmond? Well, we know he's a Mormon. He's got lovely teeth. I know that. Oh, the teeth were, mm. are in the poster, spectacular. I'm thinking of coming on with dark glasses on, you know, the Princess Margaret wraparound ones. <laughs> and see, so, well, I've just met Donny in the wings. But um, I can't, I can say no more. I've said too much, David. You have. I, I will just add before we um, move to another subject that you've got, gosh, experience um, with uh, men with huge shiny teeth. Uh, what's his name? Um, Rylan? What about Rylan? He's got enormous white teeth now. But what's my experience of Rylan? Well, you've had experience of big shiny teeth. Do you think you might get some yourself? Very happy with my own teeth that nature gave me, thank you. Lo lovely teeth and indeed bone structure. Um, now, there's another production coming up that was uh, delayed by... Is there an interval soon? Yes, there is, funnily enough. Yes, <laughs> it's coming up very soon. <laughs> Carry on. Before we get there, we do want to mention the musical of your first book, The Bowls. We do. I mean, this is... Of all the things going on, this is the thing that excites me um, as much as any. I've, I've written a musical version of the first Bolds book, The Bolds, which will be on at the Unicorn at Christmas. And, you know, I've written it and they've workshopped it and I went to see a sort of presentation and I just cry. I just cry right the way through to see words you've written brought to life and actors adding what they've got to do and musicians and... Um, I was slightly embarrassed by myself. I was just sort of blubbing in the corner. <laughs> well, um, this, uh, as you say, is uh, a musical based on your first book, The Bolds. It's about a family of hyenas uh, living as uh, human beings in uh, Teddington, I believe. Uh, it opens on 14th of November at London's Unicorn Theatre. And uh, yes, it was workshopped just, uh, well, uh, a little, a few months be before the pandemic. I, I came along and had a Varda. I have to say, Jules, I was terribly impressed with the music. I know. Well, it's not just me. Um, Simon Wallace writes the music and I write the lyrics, but some of the tunes come to me in my sleep. The first song came when I was on holiday. Um, I just woke up in the morning and started singing Meet the Bowls. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? I was channeling something Maldivian. Um, so yes, it's, I can't wait for that. And, the, and it, I think it's being cast now. And um, we did it, we did one of the workshops. We had um, Le Gâteau Chocolat, you know who that is? Yes, he, he was Mr. Bold, he was wonderful. Oh, if there's a chance of having him. We've asked him, but he can't, he can't do it. He's doing something else, but. Panto, probably. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, this could be a franchise, couldn't it, uh, uh, Jules? Because you've, you've written quite a few Bolds books now. <laughs> I've written six. Six? Yeah. Oh. I know, I, I'm not quite out most summers. Mm. Um, well, isn't it marvellous that you're having such a busy time at your at your age, Julian? Whatever well, it's, it's because of you know, lockdown and COVID, there's a backlog. So everything is a bit of a car crash, but um, I mean, I'm enjoying it. You know, it was a shock to the system having to leave the house and leave my husband and my dogs. But um, now I'm in the in full throttle, as it were. What fun. It's light entertainment. That's what I like to hear. Glad you mentioned dogs just then, uh, Julian, because we're going to come back to the subject of dogs in the second part of the show. Uh, Julian's written a book called The Lick of Love. We're going to be discussing that and much more besides. But uh, right now, here's the interval you asked about. Let's talk about that. <laughs> We're going to take a break now. It's the one you've been uh, looking forward to. And uh, I'd like you please to have a look at this uh, trailer 
for a peccadillo release. It's called Who's Gonna Love Me Now? And it's a documentary about an Israeli who was, for a time, a member of the London Gay Men's Chorus. And uh, after you have a look at this, I'll tell you why it's such an appropriate film for this episode of the show. <laughs> On a Saturday night, everybody's waiting for me. And why is it important to you to be here today? These people became my extended family, and um, I love them. up on them giving you a chance. Stila, 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 Stila. Zik liot homo, tachzor liot straight. Ki lo roe oti, lo roe oti bichlan. As soon as I got my diagnosis, the first thought that came into my head, who's gonna love me now? Who's gonna love me now? I can't go to the street and come back defeated or come back hurt. Mali shu rotsel avolat ima makela. Ich kotev konzert makela de gvarim. Ich hol lo nicht an der Schein der makela bigla she. Was kommen da makela? The London Gay Men Choir. It's like Leonardo DiCaprio in the Titanic. <laughs> um, that's uh, Who's Gonna Love Me Now. Uh, it's now on peccadillopod.com. But if you get this DVD, also released by Peccadillo, you'll find that among the extras is a live Q&A from London's Barbican Centre Hosted by, yes, it's Julian Clary. Oh, I remember that, yes. What a night that was, Jules. You not only talked um, to uh, the stars and directors of the film, but the whole of the London Gay Men's Chorus turned up as well. Yes, I thought the backstage buffet disappeared pretty quickly. <laughs> oh, mm, good fun. Um, I was there and it was a wonderful night. Um, we're moving on to uh, The Lick of Love. As I mentioned, it's published on October the 14th by uh, Quercus. What, what's a Quercus when it's at home, please, Jules? Oh, it sounds like a Latin word for some sort of um, group of people. Like, uh, is that right? Is that what it is? It could be. A quorum, that's what I'm thinking. I don't know what Quercus means, but I expect it's Latin. It could be not dissimilar to a Quercus. If you'd done your research, you would have looked it up yourself. I was hoping you'd be able to tell me. Um, the first volume of your autobiography, A Young Man's Passage, was published in 2005. There it is. Look, it's got fingerprints on it. It's been a bit thumbed, uh, this book. Um, the new book brings your story, Jules, right up to date. In fact, to this year. But this time, the story isn't just about you, is it? No, it wasn't. It, it, well, no, it isn't. It, it's about the dogs in my life because I, I, I was, um, the last book finished with the Norman Lamont, all oh, those police sirens in Swindon. Can you hear that? We can, yes. Shoplifting, I expect. Someone's, someone's stolen a baguette in Lidl. Um, the last book finished in 1993, was it? 91? Uh, anyway, so there was some time to fill in. And um, I was approached by my editor, actually. I've, I've been thinking about writing and you bringing things up today. Anyway, she, she had the idea of writing about the dogs in my life and sort of weaving that into what's happened to me because that is quite a nice thing to do because it's, it's not all about me and it's not, I don't know, it just, changes the focus a bit and um, 
in the writing of it, I, I sort of came to believe that each dog that I've had, and we, each dog anyone has in a way, hopefully, enhances your life in some way and teaches you things. And, and, and the more I thought about it, I think, well, they must be sent to you by some higher deity. Um, so for example, Fanny the Wonder Dog came into my life when I was 20 and I was, believe it or not, quite a shy, unadventurous youth. And she, she had this eagerness for life, you know, which forced me um, into situations I wouldn't normally have experienced and she came on stage with me because there was nowhere else for her to go and she livened the whole thing up and she kind of gave the act a bit of charisma that it wouldn't otherwise have had and then when Fanny died and I got Valerie, Valerie was very kind of serene dog and she was quite kind of matronly in a way you know, and I feel that she restrained me during the excessive times why have you got your finger up? I just wanted to uh, interrupt you there before we got to uh, Valerie, uh, okay. because um, um, Fanny, of course, was your most famous dog. Not only did she have lifelong fame, she's got posthumous fame. I mean, you mentioned that people still ask you to this day if she's alive. Well, when I'm walking my current dogs in... Regent's Park or wherever I'm walking them, people do come up sometimes and say, is that Fanny the Wonder Dog? As if I would have a 48 year old dog <laughs> trotting along beside me. Um, and I was in the airport terminal in Auckland a few years back and someone said, you know, we remember Fanny. I mean, she achieved this marvelous thing of disappearing at the height of her popularity, I think. Um, showing you how to do it and uh, no she did seem to touch a lot of people and, and she you know I hesitate to attribute um, comic talent to animals but she did seem to have comic timing and she would glare at people in a certain way <laughs> um, and yes people remember her. It's true and as you, as you said in, in New Zealand surely Fanny is the only dog who can get a, who's dead and can get a round of applause on the other side of the planet. Yes, I love that. If I mention her name anywhere, um, she gets a round of applause. I'm going Amazing. To, I'm going to go off on a sidetrack uh, now, slightly, um, Jules, because I've learned a lot from you uh, down the, oh God, 40 years. Decades. I'm afraid it's true. Um, but the most important thing I've learned from you is the importance of being honest. Now, if you've read my book, I'm just going to flash it there. That's enough of that. You don't want to see any more of that. Um, if you've read my book, you'll know that I used to tell a lot of lies. But because I met Julian Clary, I discovered that it, you know it's not worth it. This tangled web we weave when we, we tell fibs. Uh, it's much easier to always be honest. But I think, Julian, you're much more courageous in your honesty than I could ever be, because there's an example in the book. You were given a pug dog. I believe it was a very yes. dog, but you didn't get on. And you phoned up the people who gave this dog to you and said, I don't want this dog. Come and take it away. I'm not sure many people could be that honest. Well, um, yeah, I've got this thing about dogs that, you know, you have to be led to them and you have to, there's a sort of psychic thing going on, which is hard to analyze, but you know when you meet the right dog. And you, I knew when I saw Fanny in the back of a, in a, some sort of yard in, in, in sitting in a rabbit hutch, I thought, well, and I was 20 years old and on the dole and, not, it wasn't a sensible thing to do, but the, the compulsion was there and I had to have that dog. And, and you know, she enhanced my life in, in lots of different ways. Um, it was soon after Fanny died that my agent and a producer friend of hers could see that I was unhappy and they decided that, and I'd said I liked pugs, I wanted a pug. So they thought they'd give me one. And anyway, they came around with a box of the pink ribbon on and inside was this pug <laughs> called Maureen. And um, I was thrilled to begin with. And then 
on they left and I was left alone with this dog and it just wasn't right you know um I couldn't stand the sight of her it's a terrible thing to write about in a book about dogs which dog lovers are going to read and I suppose I should love all dogs um but she was so irritating in every way and pugs are very needy or she was and you couldn't do anything you know if I went if I had a shower I'd look behind me and she'd be pressed against the glass um if you move if you went to the toilet she'd have to sit between your legs and it was it was exhausting you know I'm, I'm I didn't like it and I thought about how kind these people had been to give her to me and I I'm I thought I've got to face the truth and I fa I did phone them up and say that I'm really sorry I can't live with this dog for the next de next 16 years or ho however long out of politeness please come and take her away okay. now <laughs> very brave was it brave what was their reaction um can't remember now um it was, it was the whole story was awful you know they 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 took her back to the breeder and I then felt guilty and I wanted to know that she'd been snapped up and gone to the right home and weeks and months went by and Maureen was still sitting there and I was at the point of saying oh no I'll have to have her back you know and then we heard that she'd been taken by an elderly widow um, to live in Westcliff on Sea or somewhere like that which was perfect you know this widow would love when she's shuffling into the bathroom to have a pug sitting between her panty liners i mean what more do you want but it wasn't for me well there's a moral to this story and it's as you write buying a dog for someone is risky so think twice now i can tell you now because you haven't read the book yet that um as far as honesty is concerned julian had a relapse okay i'm going to remind you of this incident uh, julian one of your pieces of Campbell nonsense was was going into the, I think, the Aldrich Theatre. And at the same time, a production of Private Lives was getting out. And you <laughs> stole something. I did. Um, well, because um, I used to be called the Joan Collins Fan Club. And because Joan Collins had been doing Private Lives there the night before, and as I arrived at the theatre, they were unloading all of the set of Private Lives. And I'd been to see it and it was marvellous and she was wonderful. And um, somehow <laughs> there was a vase, a sort of faux 1920s style vase that found its way into my clutches. And I thought, I have to have it. This was, it symbolised, you know, me and Joan together in the same place. Isn't life funny? And um, yes, was that is that dishonest? That's not dishonest. That's just theft. <laughs> it's theft. Have you still got the vase? I have got it. It's in storage at the moment. Yes, and Joan, because I then became friends with Joan, and she came to stay in with me in Kent. And I said, "Do you recognise anything in this room?" <laughs> and I pointed out the vase. Uh, oh, how we laughed! Oh. Uh, um, much humour derived from that good. Um, as you said, we're finally getting back to this now, Julian. Um, after Fanny's death, you replaced her with a Valerie. You felt she might be a reincarnation of Fanny. Yes, of course she wasn't. This was my fervent hope when I, I met her. Um, she, I, I quieted her through a, a roundabout way. Um, uh, the urge to get a dog came upon me when I was filming a Daz advert in Croydon or somewhere awful. And um, I said to my assistant, Bertha, I've got to have a puppy. Uh, go and get me a puppy. Go and find out if there's any puppies for sale. And anyway, she couldn't find one. But the, the driver of the Winnebago or my car, whatever, he'd overheard the conversation. And he said, I happen to know about a little whippity crossbreed puppy um, that is looking for a home. Um, on an estate in Clapham. And I said, take me there at once. And there were two puppies there, Valerie and Latifa, and I chose um, Valerie. And uh, I was sure that she was Fanny reincarnated. Foolish of me. She had, she had no talent. 
it was all wishful thinking. No, she had no talent at all. I, I dragged the poor dog on stage. I was found myself doing an adult weekend in Butlins <laughs> in Skegness a few weeks later. And uh, she was horrified about being on stage, so she never attempted it again. Well, but she was a lovely dog. She was a lovely dog, um, indeed. We, we move on to a, a dog you still have. This is Albert, who was famously dumped in your lap during a TV programme with uh, uh, Paul O'Grady. Um, alas, we can't go into great detail about all your dogs, but I'm going to use this as an excuse to talk about uh, something else, because while uh, you had ownership of uh, Albert, you took part in a play you mentioned earlier in the programme, and it was at the Trafalgar Studios, it was called La Grand Mort. And what astonished me from your book, Jules, is your revelation that sometimes during the performances, members of the audience were pleasuring themselves. Well, so it seemed, um, so it was, the, so it was, because, you know, the Trafalgar Studios is is tiny and um, the the front row is just a few feet away, literally. And um, in the course of the play, James Nelson Joyce took all his clothes off and he had very um, admirable chiseled physique and God had been kind to him. And um, what he had to do was take all his clothes off and then throw me around the, this kitchen set. <laughs> and um, Yes, it, it, word got round, and there, there was a, a, we were aware of this sort of rhythmical movement going on in peripheral vision on occasion. But you know, you've bought a ticket; you can do it you like. That's what I'm saying. Um, but uh, moving on from this filth, it was a marvelous experience for you, wasn't it? As far as business was concerned, because you had an enormous soliloquy at the beginning of the play, during which I think you had to cook a three-course meal. I had to cook a, a, a pasta alla puttanesca um, and, we, and chop the garlic and peel tomatoes and boil pasta and everything had to be done just so. And it's a bit, it was a bit like the dresser as I've learned, you know, certain actions get tied to certain parts of the text but there was I did one one night I did forget to get the tomatoes out of the fridge so a whole four minute section was missing and it was only when I went to serve the food um, at the end of the soliloquy I realized it wasn't the right color because there were no tomatoes involved so um, I went back to the fridge and back to the missing dialogue, missing part of the speech, and quickly chopped the tomatoes, flung them in, and no one would have known, surely. This is where years of improvisation come in handy. Now, your latest uh, dog, Jules, is, is Gigi, who you describe as Jekyll and Hyde. Why is <clears throat> that? Well, she's completely crackers. I mean, she, she was... My husband found her on one of those um, dog rescue sites. Um, she was in Serbia and all you see is a photograph and you have to sort of commit. But there was something, we both felt this need to give her a home. So she was delivered. So she'd been living feral, feraly. Is that the word? It is, yes. She'd been living feral life in a graveyard in a town called Nis, which I like to refer to as a piss. Um, and she's got no manners, you know, she, she's a tiny dog, but she clearly had to fight for her rights and in order to survive among all the other feral dogs there. Um, so anyway, she was, she was delightful for a couple of days, but she was biding her time. Then the true nature came out, this sort of fur bullet flew into the room and she attacks Albert. She bites his ankles. And when he bends down to see what's going on, she goes for the throat. It's all good fun. And she's ever so funny and amusing, but she is possessed by the devil, we've decided. I have to ask this, uh, uh, Jules, does she show any promise as a performer? Uh, do you know, she is, she doesn't like, because of her, past she's very set in her ways she likes her routine 
and she's panic stricken if she gets in a car and goes somewhere different. I think she thinks she's going back in a lorry and um, I don't know what she thinks, but we try not to disturb her very much. I am doing some book events in London. So if she could bear to come with me to, is it Sadler's Wells I'm doing something? Oh, that wouldn't surprise me. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, I might take her on, but I don't want to upset her and I don't want to frighten her. Um, but she'll probably become, you know, the delightful simpering, <laughs> what a sweet dog, Gigi, for a couple of hours. No one would know. Um, but there's no evidence at the moment of any talent. Mm -hmm. uh, time will tell. Uh, in any sense, um, have dogs got you through lockdown, Julian? Yes, they have. Um, in, in several ways, you know, the routine of, because another thing about Gigi is she won't relieve herself in the garden for reasons known only to her. She has to go out. So it's a matter of urgency every morning. So while the rest of the country was lolling around, you know, staying in bed till lunchtime, I was up at the crack, David, <coughs> walking Gigi and Albert. And so that gave my day, you know, a bit of a, a, a good kick start. And then I would settle down to write about the dogs. So dogs in every way, you can't go wrong, but they enhance your life. Why you haven't got one, David, I don't know. Um, I'm thinking about it and it is very tempting. Hmm. That's as far as I'm going. It's not like you'd go out anywhere. I mean, you're at home all the day. I know, might as well take a <laughs> you, dog out. You meet interesting people in the park. That's another thing. That is absolutely, it, it, isn't that true? Mm. Um, and people with dogs live longer, that's all I'm saying. Oh, well, in that case, I'm getting straight <laughs> onto the back. Getting, getting several. As soon as we finish this, and talking about finishing this, yes, we've got to wind it up, Julian. Oh, what a shame. But look, I've got lots more to ask you. In fact, we haven't even mentioned the embarrassing interview I did with you in 2005. And we haven't mentioned the fact that you're going back on the road with your own show, Born to Mince, next year. So would you mind us sticking around to give, give Patreon subscribers a bit of a thrill? Is this where you try to lure people into paying more money to, to hear the rest of the interview? As, as, as we've already established, I'm now very honest and I have to reply, yes. Yes, don't do it, punters, is all I can say. Keep your money. Julian, thank you so much for joining us. Dolly Diamond said you'd be difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, it's been smashing. Will you uh, join me again um, next week, uh, lovies, when my guest will be David Del Valle. He's a Hollywood gossip monger. He's met everyone, and I dread to think what he's going to say about them. Probably I'll be taken off air again. But there's only one way to find out, and that's to join me next week. Patreon subscribers, please join us now. You'll find us waiting for you if you're not a subscriber. There's the link. And right now from me, David McGillivray, thank you so much. Mwah. See you next week. Bye. <laughs>